What we're going to do in this module is take a look at what virtual machines are in Azure. So what is an Azure virtual machine versus you know, a traditional virtual machine? We'll look at how we create VMs, look at some demos on how we accomplish that, some basic VM configuration tasks, some simple virtual machine management tasks, how we monitor, for example, performance. So, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump in. So let's take a second and compare Azure virtual machines versus on-premise Hyper-V virtual machines. Now, for most administrators, this is where the biggest difference becomes. And it's not something that you should be afraid of, it's something you should embrace. There's differences in the way they're configured and differences in the way you manage them. And so there's changes in how you think about your virtual machines as an element of your infrastructure. Let's begin by taking a look. The single biggest thing that I think most administrators um, you know, get uncomfortable with is this notion that within Azure, there is no console access to a virtual machine. This is both a security design point and also a point of ensuring that no one else can get access to anything and no one else can see what's going on in your VM. The only way you get console access is if you run on Hyper-V. Within Azure, it's RDP access only. The second point here, very important point, only generation one virtual machines. If you're creating a virtual machine on Hyper-V, it has to be a generation one or it cannot migrate to Azure. If you require a generation two virtual machine, Hyper-V is going to be your solution. Azure does not support the VHDX file format. Now that comes as a shock to a lot of people, but it's no big deal. You can run a simple PowerShell command and you can convert any VHDX to VHD and stick it in Azure. So the file format is not an issue. Up upgrade to the guest operating system within Azure, not supported, you would deploy a different version of the operating system. Requires ownership of physical hardware. With Azure, you don't own the physical hardware. Microsoft does. You're simply leveraging their hardware. Can you run antivirus? Both of them support antivirus. And then more than one network adapter. It depends on the size of the VM. Many VMs support multiple network adapters. When you're deploying a virtual machine, you've got to choose a size that supports more than one NIC. So, it gives you an idea of you know, as you're comparing my on-premise Hyper-V with Azure, what are some of the major differences between the two? Okay, in this first module, let's take a look at an introduction to IaaS virtual machines. Now, a great place to start is, you know, identifying what is a good virtual machine workload to actually put on Azure. We know we can run virtual machines on Hyper-V in our data center, but does everything we do in our data center translate to Azure? Is everything we do in our data center suitable to run on Azure? And the answer is that, well, not everything is. So what do we recommend? What are the suitable workloads for Azure? Anything that requires high availability. Clustering and high availability is a fairly complex thing to configure and requires you know, a fairly deep uh, amount of IT knowledge. Azure makes it very easy to configure geographically distributed, highly available virtual machines. You don't need to understand the underlying storage and network fabric to do it, you can take a workload or an application in a VM, place it on Azure, and let Azure take care of the high availability. Any type of virtual machine that has unpredictable growth. So, you know, if I, I, the example I use a lot and I will continue to use is an accounting firm. We know that in April of the year, we're going to need to grow our capacity significantly because it's tax season. Azure virtual machines allow us to do that by sizing up and sizing down without having to buy additional underlying hardware. We can simply make the virtual machine bigger, pay for it, and then shrink it down again. It's also great for workloads that are very, very steady. So we know that you know, we need just this one little app to do this one little thing, and it's going to be very steady all the time. The cost of Azure for these steady workloads is incredibly low. Some things that are unsuitable for Azure. Um, anything that is very low, very low capacity. You know, if you're running this and it's just a background app, it doesn't use a lot of, a lot of energy, it doesn't use a lot of compute power, you're probably going to wind up paying more on Azure just for running the virtual machine uh, than you will get out of the benefits. So anything that's a very small workload, you know, probably not that suitable. And then any environment that is, you know, heavily, heavily, heavily regulated, um, maybe not suitable for Azure because Azure is going to want to take control of certain things. 
if you don't want to use a virtual machine or if the application in the virtual machine you know, is not suitable, there's other alternatives. For example, you can use app service or service fabric. Instead of running the app in a VM, change the application a little bit, run the application directly on Azure. What's supported in Azure Virtual Machines? Anything that you can install on Windows Server as an app, you can run in Windows Server on Azure. It's still Windows Server, nothing in Windows Server has changed just where it's running. So any app you can run on Windows Server, if you can run it in Hyper-V or in, on, on hardware, you can run it in Windows Server on Azure, including things like SharePoint, System Center, et cetera. You can also run many Linux distributions on Azure. Now Microsoft does provide certain Linux distributions that it certifies and supports, but it, there are many other Linux distributions that are not you know, certified and supported that you can also run on Azure. Once you put your virtual machine on Azure, you need to think about sizing. Now, sizing determines things like, well, the price, obviously. The bigger the virtual machine, the more it's going to cost. However, sizing also determines to a degree the capability of the virtual machine. For example, some virtual machines allow multiple NICs. Some sizes have multiple NICs. Some do not. Some virtual machines are 4, 16, 32 cores. Others might be smaller. Some virtual machines include GPUs, graphical processing units. Some do not. So choosing the size of the virtual machine, and we'll see how to do this in a second, is going to determine what basic features and capabilities that virtual machine has, but also the underlying cost of that virtual machine. So what we'll do is, is take a second and just take a look at some of the sizing of virtual machines. You'd move to Azure, create a virtual machine for the workload, and you can then adjust the size of that virtual machine as the demand goes up or goes down. To adjust the size of a virtual machine, you simply find the virtual machine within your Azure portal, whether it's the classic portal or in the case what we're using right here, the new portal. We're going to click on it. It's going to open the properties blade for that virtual machine. And then down here towards the bottom, we're going to have a VM size option. Now, depending on the region or the area that you've deployed this virtual machine in, the available sizes may vary a little bit. For example, G-Class virtual machines are not available everywhere. And so we can see that right now, I can just go through, look at the sizes, and then it gives me just an estimate of what the cost of running that size is. And let's say I want to move this to a, well, let's do a D2 V2. We'll click on it, click Select, and it's going to go out and adjust the size of that virtual machine. Be aware, however, that in most cases, it's got to reboot the virtual machine to adjust the size. So you want to take care to plan size adjustments because they may very well incur some downtime. This next module, we're going to look at how we create virtual machines in Windows Azure. Now, to get started, we want to do a little bit of thinking, want to do a little bit of planning. We don't just simply go in and create a VM. We've talked about, you know, what are the workloads that are suitable for Azure, and we obviously want to begin and determine, you know, is the thing that we're going to put in this virtual machine even a suitable workload for Azure? So there's a couple of things we're going to do, you know, during that, that process. Number one, we're going to size the VM. So we talked about the sizing tool. Make sure that we can create an appropriate size and make sure the cost is going to be effective. We want to learn how to connect to the virtual machine. How are we going to manage it? Is this going to be part of a domain? Is it going to be standalone? If it's standalone, are we connecting to it with PowerShell? So how do we manage that virtual machine when we consider the entire management strategy of all the resources we've got to have? How, what is the networking going to look like? How are we going to connect to it? Is this going to be a simple standalone service that we put in Azure and connect to over the web? Or is this going to be on our network, maybe via VPN? And then finally, how do I back up and restore it? Azure provides disaster recovery and provides fault tolerance, but it's still ultimately up to you to make sure that you leverage those tools and those capabilities to have a backup of your virtual machine. If we're thinking about doing a migration, there are some things we want to keep in mind. If we're going to upload the virtual machine, convert it to a VHD, we have to generalize it using sysprep. If it's a running virtual machine that's already in our environment, it has to be sysprep before it can go into Azure. Now, in many cases, that's going to prevent you from doing that migration if you're running an application that, for example, cannot be sysprepped. 
And then finally, it's got to be a fixed size virtual disk. Now the good news is the upload will convert it to a six fixed size virtual disk. So you can have it as a dynamic on, on, a, on a local Hyper-V server. If you use the right tools, it'll convert it to a fixed size on the way up so you don't upload all this empty data. There are several tools at your disposal to do this. You have the portal, both the new and the classic. Bear in mind the classic portal can only use version one virtual machines. The new portal can do both version one and version two virtual machines. Now, these are not to be confused with generation one and generation two. The version two virtual machines or V2VMs on Azure are created with the Azure Resource Manager. You can do this via PowerShell, and you can also do this via the Azure cross-platform client that we're going to talk about towards the end of this module. And then finally, you can do it in the portals. You can do a quick create in the classic portal, which is creates a VM for you from a template VHD. There's a gallery which contains, you know, it's a library of virtual machines. A lot of them have pre-installed software like SQL Server. And in the new portal, this is all done via the Azure Marketplace. So with that in mind, let's look at some ways that we can create basic Windows virtual machines within Azure. Okay, let's go ahead and use the Azure portal to create a new Windows virtual machine. I'm going to click on Virtual Machines, and then just click Add. Now, what this is going to give me is the list of all the different virtual machine options that are in the Azure Marketplace. And you know, there's literally hundreds and hundreds in here, and you can scroll through and search and kind of find the operating system or the solution or the virtual machine configuration that you're looking for. We're going to do a simple Windows Server virtual machine. And it's going to give us all the different variations of a Windows Server virtual machine that we can deploy. And so the one we're going to choose is a Windows Server 2012 R2 data center. So it's the current release of Windows Server. We'll choose that. It's going to ask us for a deployment model. Now we're going to use the resource manager deployment model, which is the, the deployment model used by the new Azure portal, not the classic deployment, which is based on services that was used by the old portal. And then we're going to click create. Now it's going to prompt us for some basic information. So for example, what's the name of this VM? Let's call it server one. What type of disks do I want to have? We're going to go with SSDs, a username, a password, the subscription, and then we're going to put this in a new resource group, which we're going to call servers. And then finally, the location, which data center do we want this created in? So we satisfied all these basic requests, basic information to create the VM. We'll click OK. The next step is the virtual machine size. So based on the data center that we selected, we're going to see the available sizes of virtual machines. Now, it's giving us initially only the recommended virtual machine. We can view all available sizes to, to see all our options. You can see there's a lot of choice in here. I'm going to go with just a very simple, low-end, standard virtual machine. Click on it, and then hit Select. Next, we've got some optional features. So if we want to now get into configuring things like the details of our networking, the details of our public IP addresses, any inbound firewall rules. We can define all this as we're creating the VM. We're not going to change anything in here, so we're just going to go ahead and click OK. It's now going to validate that you know what we've asked Azure to do can be done in the data center location we've selected. So it's validating all those different settings. It tells us it's passed, click OK, and it now submits the deployment. And so what this is going to do is in the background, go ahead and deploy that new virtual machine and then let us know when it's ready. The deployment's completed, the VM is running, and I'm automatically taken to that new virtual machine property page where I can now begin to look at it, review it, and then make any configuration changes that I want. So there you have it, pretty simple, creating a new virtual machine using the Azure portal. So now that we've created virtual machines, Let's take a look at some of the tasks involved in configuring a virtual machine. So in this case, I've got a VM running. What are some of the things I can do or might want to do to actually change or modify or just generally configure that VM? 
and that is how do I modify IP addresses? Well, to understand this, you've got to realize there's two kinds of IP addresses. Private IP addresses and public IP addresses, and they are what they sound like. A private IP address is an address used within a virtual machine to communicate with other virtual machines that are in that same Azure network. So if you, for example, RDP into an Azure virtual machine and you run an IP config command, what you're going to see is the private IP address. So this would be your, you know, your 10.0.1 or you know, whatever custom address scheme that you choose. There are also public IP addresses. These are IP addresses that are accessible from the general internet and represent ingress and egress points for traffic going to and from your virtual machine. Now, any virtual machine can be assigned a public IP address, and public IP addresses are also assigned to things like load balancers and gateways. There are two methods of assigning IP addresses, dynamic and static. Now these behave just a little bit differently than what you would traditionally think. A dynamic address is not a DHCP address. There is no DHCP in the way that we traditionally think about it in Azure. A dynamic address is an address that's simply assigned from the range of addresses on the subnet that the virtual machine is on. Now, it's allocated when the virtual machine is created or powered up, and it can change if it started or stopped. So it acts and behaves like a DHCP address, but it's not based on a lease. It's allocated when, the, when it starts up, it's deallocated when it stops, and it's pulled from the pool that is on the subnet. You don't have to create, for example, an address pool. If it's a dynamic IP, it simply grabs one from the subnet that the VM is assigned to. A static IP address, on the other hand, doesn't change. In the case of public IP addresses, they are, uh, they're released when, when the, the VM is powered off, unless they're static, in which case the, the same address is retained. For static IP addresses on the public side, you don't get to choose your IP address. You simply indicate that you want a public IP address. If it's okay that the public IP address change, you choose dynamic. If you want to re retain the same public IP, you choose static. But bear in mind, you don't get to pick your address. That's one of the key things with Azure. They have an, a range of addresses that they can assign to resources, to these external endpoints as public IPs, and they're going to give you one. You have no control or no say over what that is. So let's take a look at how we go into an actual VM and configure and manage the IP addresses. Okay, let's take a look at how we can take a virtual machine and then just modify the IP addresses to switch them between static and dynamic. And also how we allocate and manage public IP addresses. So to begin, I've already deployed um, a, a virtual machine. It's a very simple, very basic virtual machine, um, basically using all the defaults. So we're kind of starting from if you go in and, and you go to the marketplace, you pick a Windows or a Linux virtual machine and you just deploy it, take the defaults. This is essentially what you get. Um, we'll start off with the fact that when this was deployed, we gave it a public IP address. And so there's an object in here um, called app server IP, which is the public IP address that's been allocated to this virtual machine. Now the public IP address is dynamic by default, we can easily switch it to a static public IP address by coming into its settings. Looking at the configuration. And then changing it from dynamic to static. And then if we want to adding a DNS label. We'll click save on that. And we've now switched that from a dynamic public IP to a static public IP. So we know that that public IP address is not going to change if we offline the virtual machine. For the internal IP address of the virtual machine, we're going to look at the network interface that was created when the virtual machine was deployed. So we'll click on the network interface and its properties are going to open. And we've got a setting called IP configurations. We'll click on that. And we can see the IP configuration for this particular interface. Now, if we click on the IP configuration that's stored, you can see as well 
we've got public IP enabled and we can actually take, you know, if this interface didn't need a public IP address, we can disable the public IP deassociated here. Or if we needed to change it to a different public IP address, you know, for whatever reason, we can do that right here. So we click on the IP addresses and we can change the public IP that we're using. We can choose the subnet the virtual machine is connected to. We've only got one subnet, so we've only got one option. And it's by default a dynamic IP. We can then change that to a static IP. And then we can choose the IP we want, or by default, it'll pick up the dynamic IP that was assigned. So for example, I want this to be 10. I can simply change it to 10. Click Save. It'll now go make those changes. Once those changes are saved, we can come back and look and see that the configuration has kind of detected those changes and updated to reflect what the current static, statically assigned IP address is. And that's it. Any virtual machine you deploy, that's how you adjust any public or internal IP address between static, dynamic, and also enable or disable a public IP. Okay, next let's take a look at the concept of virtual machine availability. What are the tools available in Azure to govern and control availability? Within Azure, you don't have any control over which piece of hardware your virtual machines actually run on. Or do you? Well, the availability tools give you some say in how your virtual machines and your applications are deployed. And there are three major tools you have at your disposal. The first one is called an availability set. An availability set is a group of virtual machines that represent a unit that should be always available. So it's a way of taking, for example, an application to say that this application is a unit and needs to be treated as a unit. And that application becomes an availability set. It will make sure then that all components of that application stay online or go offline at the same time. You then have what's called an update domain. An update domain is if you're performing updates, revisions, applying patches or rebooting, or for example, just generally updating an application, an update domain is a unit of the application that's updated at a single time. So for example, we have different cycles, weekly updates um, or other types of updates. And then a fault domain. A fault, any, any application that is in a, the same fault domain is going to it's going to make sure that those components are distributed across physical pieces of hardware. For example, if you have a cluster or maybe a two-tier application and that application is in the exact same fault domain, it's going to make sure that not all components are on the same location within the same data center. It's going to make sure they're distributed so that no one outage can take down your entire application. Typically, you would have multiple virtual machines at a layer. If those virtual machines are in the same fault domain, it's going to distribute those virtual machines across the Azure fabric to make sure that a failure in any one location will not affect all components. So it's a way of forcing them to be separated. You would have multiple VMs in an availability set. Application tiers would be in separate availability sets. And then you could combine this with load balancing to make sure that you equally distribute. And we're going to talk about load balancing in a later module, but to make sure you can equally distribute all the load across all the different physical locations and physical pieces of hardware within Azure. So let's take a look at how we create and configure availability sets. Let's take a look at the process for creating an availability set within an Azure resource group. Now to start, I've got a resource group created. There's nothing in it. Um, the plan is to put a bunch of virtual machines in here that represent a multi-tier application. Uh, we have a web tier, which is going to have the web application, and a database here is going to have the back end. And so that's going to have a number of SQL Server instances in it. So we're going to ahead and go ahead and create two availability sets, one here via the console uh, or the portal and one via PowerShell. So we'll click on add and we're just going to search for availability set. And it's going to bring us to the, the list of options and one of them is a standard Microsoft availability set, which we're going to go ahead and click create on. Now, I'm going to give it a name, call this one web tier. 
and we're going to set two properties. One of them is the number of fault domains. And again, remember the number of fault domains you can think of as the number of racks that all the objects that are assigned to this availability set are going to be spread over. So if I spin up three web servers, if I have three fault domains, I know they're, they're going, each going to be physically separated. So something like a power failure or an equipment failure is only going to affect one of the three fault domains. And then I have my update domains, which is the number of virtual machines that can be you know rebooted for update or maintenance are going to be taken offline for any sort of planned maintenance activity at any one point in time the more update domains you have the less the impact of a maintenance cycle would be for example if azure were patching the underlying hosts and i had 10 update domains i'm only going to lose one tenth of my capacity during one of those update cycles. If I have two update domains, I'm going to lose 50% of my capacity during those update cycles. So the defaults are three and five. We're just going to leave them at that. That's just fine. And we're going to go ahead and click create. So do a validation and it's going to go ahead and submit the deployment for the update domain. Now let's go ahead and shift over to PowerShell and do our update domain, or excuse me, our availability set for the data tier. And so to do this, our first log on. And we're going to type a get Azure RM availability set. And we should see that in this resource group, that we have one update domain. And so there it is right there. Here's our web tier update domain. Now let's go ahead and create the data tier update domain. New Azure RM availability set, resource group name, the name of the availability set, the location, and then our number of update domains, which we'll set to a similar five, and our fault domain count, which we'll set to the default of three. And so that submitted the job to create that second update domain. Let's go back to our portal, look at the contents of our availability set, and we'll see we've now got a data tier availability set and a web tier availability set. Within each of those, I've got three fault domains and five update domains. Now, to create a virtual machine and assign it to an availability set, it's simply a matter of just adding a virtual machine and specifying that availability set when you create it. So we're going to create a Windows Server 2012 data center virtual machine. And as I begin to configure it, we're going to be able to choose our availability set. Scroll down and we can here we can select our resource group. Hit OK. Choose our size, again, standard stuff for creating a virtual machine. And then on our settings, we're just going to leave all the networking and storage for default. And we can see that we have the option to select an availability set, which is set to none by default. So we'll select that. And because this is our first web server, we're going to pick our web tier. Now, again, I'd need to create more than one virtual machine to actually leverage this. So this works best with something like a virtual machine scale set, for example, where you've got multiple VMs and it can make sure that as the application scales up and scales down, it honors the rules of the availability set to make sure that you have high availability in the event of maintenance updates or in the event of a power failure.
click OK. It'll submit this deployment and we've now created that first virtual machine in an availability set.